Hey everybody, and welcome back to Jim's Garage. Today, I've got a video that I've been wanting to do for a while, and it's a crucial piece of the puzzle for your home lab. How do you back it up? Well, in this video, I'm gonna show you how to do that. I'm gonna discuss all of the tools that I use, and more broadly, the principle that I enact, and the whole pipeline from data creation through to backup locally, through to encryption, and backup offsite. So let's jump into that. So the data that I have on my network is multiple. I have network shares that are not only my data, but importantly, on my family's data as well. I have all of the data that sits inside my Docker containers. I have all of the configurations for many of my systems, my access points, my switches, all of those things. I have the virtual machines themselves and those backup configs. And also I have the remote backups that I want to store off-site. So not just on my TrueNAS, also off-site in Google Drive. And to do that, I use a myriad of tools. I first start off ensuring that I've got redundancy. So wherever possible, my servers that are running my containers, my applications, those will always be on RAID so that I've got some redundancy. In terms of backup, pretty much everything is backed up to my TrueNAS server. And that acts as my hub for securing all of my local backups. So before I get into how I do it, I wanna talk a little bit about the key principles. So for me, the most important thing is my data. My infrastructure, yeah, that's annoying if it goes, but hopefully I've got my configs. But it's really the data that I care about. It's things like your family photos, your documents, your work, etc. Those are the things that you really care about. So that's where I focus on first. I make sure that all of my controls are robust around securing my data, encrypting that data, and also having that 3 2, one backup strategy. So I have three copies of my data. I have one on my host and one on the other host, so it's replicated across the two hosts. I then have another local backup on my TrueNAS server. And finally, I do a third backup in the cloud that uses our clone to encrypt that and upload it into Google Drive. So some of the tools that I'm using to do this, for my Docker containers, I use Restic. It's a lightweight container. It does incremental snapshots for your backups. So it's about as efficient as you can get. You're not gonna be chewing up your reserve space each day doing full backups. You can do incremental updates on your containers. On top of that, the other key piece of the puzzle for me, application-wise, is our clone. Our clone is an excellent piece of software, and it even has a web GUI that you can look at and explore your shares and also monitor your uploads and transfers. Our clone is what uploads my data from my TrueNAS into Google Drive. And I'll share with you the config that I have for that and how you can remotely control that as well, which is really powerful. For my Kubernetes pods, I use Longhorn, and that Longhorn storage is across both nodes, again, on RAID hard drives. So I've got both a backup in terms of two nodes on different machines, plus I've also got some redundancy baked in because both of those are in a RAID format. For configuration files, wherever possible, I try to use email because it's quite easy. I also have some scripted downloads uh, and try and set reminders to download those locally and upload them. But I find that email is acceptable, especially if they're encrypting those config files. Like Sophos XG, for example, I get a weekly backup every week and it's encrypted. So happy days. So let's start off with the basics then. Let's look at how we can do the configs. Then we'll jump into how we can backup our Docker data using Restic. I'll then show you how you can backup your virtual machines using Proxmox backup server. I'll then show you how you can upload that data offsite to a cloud storage provider with encryption using our clone. So looking at the Docker Compose file, a bit like our other videos, this is a multi-service Docker Compose file. Restic is made up of three components. The first one is the actual Restic container itself the one that does all of the backing up. And in there, you can specify whether you want to run this on startup, 
I leave that on just because sometimes I want to do an ad hoc backup. So to do that, I can simply just restart the container. And I know when it restarts, it's going to do a backup of all of my data. That might be important if you've just made a significant change or you've upgraded a container. There's a million options why that's good. So I leave it on, but if you don't want it on, just set that to false. You specify the time period. So I do twice a day, every 12 hours, but you can specify a time period that suits your needs or the sensitivity of your data, something like that. You can choose the password. So this is basically used for encrypting that data. I really recommend that you do this because you wanna make sure that your backups are secure especially if you're going to store them offline or remotely. Just to know, we'll also be doing encryption with our clone as well. So it'll be kind of double encrypted. And importantly as well, you can specify how long you want to keep it, i.e. that retention period. So I've set it to keep the last 10 backups. I want it to keep at least one for a daily for the past seven days. I want it to keep one for the past end of month. And I want to do that for 12 months. So as you go further back in time, you have fewer backups. And as you move closer to the recent day, you have more frequent backups. That kind of makes sense because if you make a change and it breaks something, you're probably going to realize within order of days as opposed to months. Now, worst case scenario, that might not be true. But generally speaking, it's good to have a higher frequency readily available up close and then as you have more confidence roll that off save some space go longer between your backups and then simply within the volumes we need to specify a few of those volumes especially if we're going to be storing them in remote locations the next service is really important it's the prune function and this does what it says on the tin it looks through all of your backups and basically anything that doesn't specify i.e falls outside of that retention period that you set it will go through and delete those. So for example, as soon as you have eight backups within a week, it's gonna delete the oldest one. And then finally is the check container, which basically goes through and checks that your backups are complete and checks that the backups, i.e. the ones that Restic should be doing, are to the specified time. So if it finds out that there's one missing, it will go and perform a new backup so that it can hit that target. Next is my configuration files throughout my network. Now, I'm not going to go through each one exhaustively. I'm going to show you one within Sophos XG, and you can then replicate this process across all of your configuration files if possible. So as I mentioned before, Sophos XG has backups via email support out of the box. And importantly, it also enables you to encrypt those with a password. And it's really easy to do that. And you can configure that when you set up your Sophos XG firewall, or you can do it later if you haven't done that by just going into the settings and options. The beauty of that is you've almost got by default a backup of your config file that isn't on your network. So worst comes to worst, your hard drives die, your house burns down, it gets stolen. At least you've got a copy of it within your emails. And you could download it from your emails and store it somewhere else as well in case who knows, your email account got hacked or you couldn't get access to it for whatever reason. But it's worth calling out some other common places where you might find these. For example, I use some Unify gear and within the Unify controller, you can also specify for your config files to be backed up at regular intervals. That's really handy. I also have it for a couple of other devices and switches that I have lying around. Um, all of those are taken care of automatically. For my Kubernetes, and I appreciate we haven't got to Kubernetes yet in our home lab journey, We'll get there, we'll get there. But some of the principles I'll talk about here hopefully will be useful and getting your mindset right for when we move on to Kubernetes. So the product I've chosen for my Kubernetes backups is Longhorn. Now, the way I have Longhorn configured, and, and Longhorn is a, is a product of Rancher and I use Rancher UI, that's kind of why I chose them. Um, I have it set up to both benefit from redundancy because all three of my Longhorn nodes are on different physical infrastructure, which uses RAID configuration. That's both redundancy and performance reasons. And on top of that, I also use my TrueNAS for backups of my Longhorn data. So not only is it replicated sort of three times across my physical nodes, there's also a bit like Restic, daily snapshots of that data that's saved to my TrueNAS. So I'm getting that three copies across 
two different areas locally. And, and, and Longhorn is great because the way I have it set up for high availability, one of those machines can fail. Technically, two of them could fail and it should still keep my data. And that's really useful for obvious reasons. So far in this backup journey, I've spoken about how I back up my data and how I back up my configs, but almost kind of a, a belt and braces approach. I also back up all of my virtual machines as well, just for ease mainly, and because I have space. As I've said before, the data is what I really care about. So that's where I put all of my effort in. But to make life easier, sometimes it's just quicker to snapshot a VM, for example, especially if it's got things like unique machine identifiers on it, keys, etc. Um, often it's quite easy to just back up that VM and you've got comfort that you can quickly recover should you need to. So to do that, I take full advantage of Proxmox backup server. I have Proxmox backup server on a dedicated VM node on one of my Proxmox nodes as a virtual machine. That's not quite best practice. You'd probably want to put that on a separate physical machine. But for my use case, I might change this in the future. Like I say, it's on a RAID config, so I've got redundancy. Plus, I back up that VM using its backup VM server anyway. And those VM backups are stored again on my TrueNAS. So with my data backed up, my config backed up, and my VMs backed up, that kind of gives me a 2-2 backup strategy. I've got two copies of my data across two physical devices, but we really need 321. So what we need to do is get another copy of that data and send it off site. Now, that should be fairly obvious, but it's an important step that a few people can miss. Um, and you know that the one time that you don't bother to implement it is gonna come back and bite you. Like I said, it could be a power cut, it could be a hardware failure, electricity surge, water, any, any act of God, um, and you could be in a really bad position if you don't have an off-site backup. So what do I use? Um, I use Google Drive. Um, any of the big cloud providers will be sufficient for it. You can use some of the smaller tier providers as well, for example, things like Backblaze, but you pick a solution that suits your needs and your budget. It's largely irrelevant when it comes to our clone. So what's our clone? Well, our clone is an open source, multi-threaded backup solution. It's been around for years, it replaced R-Sync, and it's, it's a really awesome tool that probably a lot of the people, more sort of the veterans within the home lab community will be using and highly recommend. And so if you're joining as a newbie trying to get into this, it's a great one-stop solution for a lot of your backup needs. And you don't even need to use it just for remote storage. You can use it from basically getting files from A to B and vice versa. So you could even use this internally if you wanted to. Um, I don't because a lot of the solutions I use already have that copying baked in. So things like Proxmox backup server, Restic, etc. But if you don't have those, you can definitely use our clone to do that. And it's gonna come with all of the features that I said, multi-threaded encryption, all of that good stuff. Another great thing about our clone is the ability for it to mount. So much like we've been mounting drives to say our Jellyfin server, for example, you could mount your remote storage as a local file system. So what do I mean? So let's say, for example, in my case, I upload my data to Google Drive. Now, if I wanted to quickly verify or check or amend a file in my remote backup, I don't have to go through a command line and upload that file manually, for example, or run another big script. I can just mount that location, i.e. my cloud provider, as a local drive on my machine. And that's really powerful because the other way to do it would be to go through the web GUI. But because I've encrypted that data in our clone, if you look at this on, say, the Google Drive web GUI, you're just going to get a load of garbled strings for files names, which it's not possible to diagnose. You don't understand which file you're looking at. So the way to do that is to mount it locally or to mount it and then access it through the R clone web GUI. And then you can amend files as you please. It's really powerful. So let's jump into the config. So for R clone, it's pretty straightforward. You simply need to specify 
the volume mounts that you're going to use for that. So think of this as the source of the data that you want to back up. So for us, if we're using RESTIC, it will be wherever we're storing that RESTIC data. For me, I have my NAS mounted to my Docker virtual machine, and I mount that as the R clone data directory. So when I spin up this container, it has access to all of my RESTIC data. And I also actually put in the root folder of my NAS because I want everything on one of my data sets to be backed up in the cloud. You can obviously configure that as you want. It should be pretty straightforward. So once you've got our clone configured, you then need to go through the command line interface wizard and set up your local and your remotes. Now, what's a remote? A remote is the place that you're going to store it. And the instructions are slightly different for each of the remotes, but there's a wealth of documentation on the R-Clone website. And if you prefer not to go into the container command line, you could actually run R-Clone on, say, your Windows machine or your Linux GUI, and then copy the config file from that into your container mount. So thanks for joining me and listening to how I do my backups, what my process is, what the tools I use, and some of the configs that I have. I will be following up this video with some detailed walkthroughs on how you can install Proxmox backup server, and further down the road, we'll get onto things like Longhorn. But if you've liked this video, please comment, subscribe, and I'd love to hear more about how you do your backups in the comments. See you soon.